welcome Inez Tenenbaum. It's such a pleasure to be here in Atlanta today to help Womenetics celebrate the Powell Awards. Elizabeth, it seems like yesterday when you and I were sitting in my living room and you were describing the vision of Womenetics and look at it now. You have built an incredible resource for purposeful women who want to reach their full potential. Womenetics is inspiring. Womenetics is empowering. So I congratulate the women who are recipients of the Powell Awards. Each of these women have been exemplary in your careers and community work, a shining example of lives being well lived. So today I'd like to speak to all of you to encourage you to further your involvement in your community and state and step forward to let your voice be heard in so many important issues as you already are, education, the environment, economic development, and human rights. So whether you speak out as an elected official, a community volunteer, a professional, or a teacher, whatever your position, you can make a difference if you speak truth to power. So I went to the Port of Savannah to watch how they deal with all the containers coming in of consumer product goods. And a woman there who had a leadership position at the Port of Savannah looked at me and she said, you know, I read your resume. You're from Pineview, Georgia. How did you get from Pineview, Georgia to be the chairman of the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission? So I wanted to share with you a little bit about my background. So it will, uh, if you're sitting on the fence and thinking about taking a risk or waiting for another door to happen, you'll see through uh, my life experiences that do these doors do happen and that if you have a purpose, which you all have, you will continue to see opportunities all along the way. So from 1994 to 2004, I was a candidate in four statewide elections in South Carolina. I ran for Lieutenant Governor, State Superintendent of Education in 1998 and 2002, and the United States Senate in 2004. Now, although I did not win the Democratic primary for Lieutenant Governor in 1994, I did run successfully in 1998 and 2002 for State Superintendent of Education, receiving more votes than anyone on the ballot. And I served as state superintendent, a job I really, really loved for eight years. Now, I was the Democratic Party's nominee for the United States Senate in 2004, but I lost that race to Jim, Jim DeMint, so my life has not all been about success. There have been, been plenty of disappointments. And then when I was nominated to the chairman of the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission, as Elizabeth said, Senator Jim DeMint was the first congratulatory phone call I received. And he also provided introductory remarks in front of the Senate Commerce Committee during my confirmation hearing. And he said, please, please confirm Inez, I do not want her to run against me again. <laughs> so your life does come full circle. And those people that you think are, you know, your political enemy turn out to be great friends. So running four statewide offices has given me so much insight, and I want to share these in hopes that if you're thinking about running for office or you're thinking about career opportunity or a challenge, that it will encourage you to take that challenge. Now, people frequently ask me, what motivates you to get in public life? I mean, how did you get involved in running for office in the first place, and what's it like to be a woman candidate? Well, my interest in politics began in Pineview, when uh, I began to hear my parents and my grandparents and my relatives all around the dinner table discussing the news of the day, news that would often involve political issues. Uh, every four years, we would watch with great interest the Democratic and the Republican national conventions. Hearing the speeches, seeing the candidates, listening to the commentators, all of it was so exciting and thrilling for me. The nominee for president was not selected in the primary process like we have now. It was selected at the convention. And so we always watch to see who is going to get the nominee, nomination, who is going to get to be vice president. And, um, and it was just drama. If you were sitting in Pineview and could get one television station, it was great drama. <laughs> So as a child, I had an awareness of the importance of electing good leaders, and I began observing the lives of public officials and their families. Also as a child, I wanted to be involved in leadership roles in my school. Uh, the rural school in Pineview, Georgia, where the population was less than 500. My first memory was wanting to be the class fire marshal in the third grade. 
Now, I lost this election to my cousin, but that did not lessen my desire to be a leader. And like my mother, my very first career was being an elementary school teacher in Georgia. After teaching four years, I left to become a state employee at the South Carolina Department of Education. I was making $6,000 a year teaching first grade in Augusta, and they offered me $12,000 a year to license Head Starts in South Carolina. So in this position, I licensed Head Starts, federally funded child care centers, and I was the liaison to the South Carolina General Assembly on, less, on legislation to license child care facilities. Now, this was the first time in my life that I had the opportunity to speak out on a social issue. It was empowering. Day after day, I'd go up to the South Carolina General Assembly as the liaison from the State Department of Social Service to advocate for a stronger child care licensing law. It was my first experience working on getting a law passed, and I was 26 years old. The year after the General Assembly passed the child care licensing law, I became the director of research for a big committee called the Medical, Military, Public, and Municipal Affairs Committee. It's called the 3M Committee of the South Carolina House of Representatives. And that was a big jump on a rung from licensing Head Starts to leading a committee in the House of Representatives. But it was in this role that I learned to appreciate and I learned to love governance and the shaping of public policy. I loved the public hearings and listening to people's problems and seeing people introduce legislation. And I was also able to work with a strong woman named Representative Jean Toll, who's part of the Therapeutic Dinner Club, a graduate of Agnes Scott, I might add. And she's now the Chief Justice of the South Carolina Supreme Court. She was the one who really encouraged me to uh, further my education, and she made me really love the work that we did. Now, the 3M committee responsible for issues relating to medicine and health and human services, aging, child welfare, the environment, adult corrections and juvenile justice, state military affairs, local government, and social services. So after working for the South Carolina House of Representatives for six years, I was accepted into USC's School of Law, as Jean Toll had encouraged me to do. And one of my friends in our therapeutic dinner groups, who was a lawyer, said, you shouldn't do this. You are going to be 35 years old when you get into law school. I said, well, I'm going to be 35 years old anyway. I may as well have a law degree. <laughs> and I love law school. And I was so glad I waited till my 30s to go because I appreciated the opportunity. Let's sit back there and listen. Let someone else do the work. And all I had to do was take the test. It was great. <laughs> and upon graduation from law school, though, I began practicing with the law firm Sinclair & Boyd in the area of health, environmental, and public policy law. And I left Sinclair and Boyd after five years because I never made my billable hour goals. And they were so kind to me, but all I wanted to do was pro bono work. <laughs> so I left and I created a nonprofit organization called the South Carolina Center for Family Policy. And my mission was to reform the state's juvenile justice system. And with the help of then Justice uh, Jean Toll, we did. But a few years later, I decided to run for Lieutenant Governor of South Carolina. I just got that feeling. Uh, I don't know, it came over me. I'd never thought about running for office. But I remember my first interview with a South Carolina editorial board, who will remain, remain nameless, whose endorsement I really, really had to have. At the end of the questions on the issues in South Carolina, the editorial page uh, editor looked at me. He said, Inez, you are very knowledgeable about the issues. You are well qualified to be South Carolina's lieutenant governor. But will South Carolina elect a diminutive woman? I was so taken aback. I said, of course, yes. But in my mind, I thought, well, we sure have elected our share of diminutive men. <laughs> and nobody ever asked them that question. So if you're thinking about running for office, uh, let me share a little bit about the personal introspective, or if you want an appointed office or doing anything that takes you in, in the public eye. The first question you have to ask is, why are you running? It's not a question that, you, uh, that people will ask you. It's one that you ask, have to ask yourself, why am I doing this? Because running for office is just not a political decision. It won, it's one that goes to the very core of your being. Knowing oneself, one's core values, are essential for a uh, successful political career. 
the unexamined life is not worth living. That's one of my favorite quotations from Socrates and has formed the foundation of my journey into public life. So once you've established your core values and you want to run for the right reasons, the next reason is to examine your life because believe you me, your opponents will examine it for you. <laughs> so if you're pondering running for a position, you should ask yourself, is this the right race for me? Other questions you have to ask yourself is, can I manage this race and my family obligations too? Can I run for this office and work full time? Can I afford to run for this office and not work full time? Can I manage my personal and professional life uh, in, uh, in, and can my personal and professional life be open to scrutiny? Am I physically able to run this race? What do I need to improve my physical stamina? Because you are all over that state all the time. I always tell candidates who come to me who are thinking of running, I said, you must work out every day. It is essential. You cannot drink any alcohol on the campaign trail and you have to have good nutrition. You have to just keep yourself in tip-top shape. The next question, can I raise this money for this race? Do I want to win this race badly enough to overcome all the obstacles and all the hardships? And the bottom line, can I win? In every race that I ran since 1994, I truly believed that I was the best candidate and that I could win. I have never believed that my gender was a handicap. So in an article entitled, Why Don't Women Run for Office, Brown University's Jennifer Lawless and Richard Fox established these findings, said women perform as well as men when they run for office. Studies show a complete absence of gender bias in terms of total votes. Winning elections has nothing to do with the sex of the candidate. So I don't ever think that my not winning in 2004 uh, in the Senate race had anything to do with my gender. In October, both my polls and Senator DeMint's polls showed me in the lead by three points. But in the end, President Bush ended up winning South Carolina by 17 points, making it impossible for a Democrat to swim against a tide, tidal wave of Republican support. But whether you're pursuing an, a public office or a corporate leadership position, it's so important to pursue your passion. And I heard that over and over again from the women who are on our panel. Your reason for living. My passion has always been and continues to be improving the lives of women and children. But as chairman of the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission, I am leading an independent federal agency that protects the public from unreasonable risk of injury and deaths from consumer products. So I am so proud of the direction and the forward-leaning direction that the CPSC has he uh, is headed under my leadership. Since more stringent rules were established in 2008, recalls of toys and recalls of toys due to violations from lead content have declined 80%. This is progress and is a result of the hard work of the staff by the CPSC. Now, since the strongest standards in the world for cribs went into effect in June of 2011, the sleep environment for babies and toddlers is safer than ever before. Go into a store that sells baby cribs and you will see the strongest crib standard in the world. These cribs are better than ever before and I am so proud of our rules on this. But infant toddlers, uh, infant walkers, toddler beds, and bed rails now have stronger mandatory safety requirements, which is another win for parents, children, and caregivers. Independent third-party uh, testing of children's products is taking place in the United States and all around the world. In, in other words, you can't sell a children's product in the United States or bring it into the country unless you send that toy or children's product to an independent laboratory and have it tested to make it sure it meets all of our world, our rules. And do you know that almost 90% of the toys sold in America are manufactured out of this country? So it's imperative that we have them tested. So independent testing of children's products is one of the most important safeguards sought by parents and consumers, and it was achieved under my leadership. So my philosophy has been take safety to the source, and that philosophy is driving the CPSC's work to work with the Chinese manufacturers to adhere to U.S. standards and build safety into product design. The CPSC's proactive work in the largest U.S. ports is another win for the consumer and another sign for the CPSC is that we are willing and able to take a stand and protect the consumers of the United States.
Because of all these accomplishments, I can confidently say to you that the state of product safety at the CPSC, it is strong and it is built to last. The CPSC is the strongest it has been in decades, and I believe we're making a strong contribution to helping purposeful women keep their families safe. One of the most inspiring parts of my job as chairman is working with other prominent female leaders in government, including Democrats Debbie Wasserman Schultz and Jan Schakowsky, and Republicans Mary Bono Mack and Joanne Emerson. Senators Amy Klobuchar and Susan Collins, and HH Sec HHS Secretary Kathleen Sebelius, just to name a few. These women display the characteristics of what I believe make a good leader. Knowledge, competence, commitment, trustworthiness, resolve, vision, and humility. Many of the women in this room have these leadership characteristics, and those of you who have been recognized to, to receive the, the Powell Award certainly do. The challenge is pro uh, providing a pathway to leadership positions to so many talented women in this state and country. So the mission of Women Addicts is to encourage young women to value public service, supporting those who are inspiring to lead and uh, are inspired to lead and recognizing good role models in public office. I want to thank Elizabeth and to everyone at Women Addicts for inviting me to speak at this wonderful event and be a part of such a vibrant, uh, meaningful uh, cause and organization here in Atlanta and across this state. I want to share with you in closing um, one of my poems that inspires me. It's by a poet named Tagore, who was a famous poet in India. And it goes like this. I sleep, slept and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and I found that life was duty. I acted and behold, duty was joy. From the wonderful stories we heard about the PAL recipients, duty is such a calling. Uh, they have found that no matter what sacrifices, no matter how much effort it takes, that duty is joy in life. And having that purpose in life and living a purposeful life is joy. So thank you for asking me to be with you today. Thank you.